Welcome back to Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers, the podcast devoted to exploring the frontiers of psychedelic medicine and what it takes to cultivate a healthy mind, body, and spirit. I'm clinical psychologist Dr. Steve Thayer, and today my co-host Dr. Reed Robison and I discuss the qualities and skills that we think are essential for psychedelic therapists to possess. If you find the show valuable, please rate it, subscribe to it, like it, share it with friends, family, colleagues, enemies even. Uh, Without further delay, please enjoy today's episode. Welcome back everybody to Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers. I am Dr. Steve Thayer here with... Reed Robison. Dr. Reed Robison. How are you doing, Steve? I'm good. I'm actually in a good mood today. Amazing. Yeah. It's, it's it. about time. I know. No, I'm, I'm what kidding. What are you talking about? I'm always in a good mood. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm always in a good mood. Steve just shed a tear on air. <sighs> Men good. need to cry sometimes. Good. It's okay. Yeah, it's we, do, we do preach uh, the wisdom and the beauty of those pesky things we call feelings, don't feelings we? Feelings and emotions. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that we try to coach people through in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, navigating their emotions, we've been doing a lot of thinking and talking about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy and what it takes to be a psychedelic assisted therapist. We've got a lot of cool clinical trials going on. We're yeah. trying to train our clinicians to do really good ketamine assisted psychotherapy. So we thought it might be fun to have an episode where we talk about some of the essential qualities and some mm-hmm. of the skills that make for a good psychedelic assisted therapist. Yeah, I think those are such, not only a fun topic, but so broadly applicable in other areas too. Like not only do a lot of therapists, clinicians, and others want to learn how to guide, trip, sit, facilitate, but this is great stuff for for helping friends, loved ones through everyday trips. I think so. You know, as I was as I was, you know, going over my notes and looking at the available literature on how to help people through a psychedelic experience, um, it occurred to me that the things that make you a good psychedelic assisted psychotherapist or guide or trip sitter or, mm-hmm. are the things that would make you a good regular old therapist or a good partner, spouse, parent, friend, employee, leader, mm-hmm. boss. I mean, these some of these are just good human qualities. Yeah, so we could really call this How to Be a Good Human. <laughs> there you go. That's a good book title. Trademark, Reed Robinson, How to Be a Good Human. It's probably out there. I feel like all the good ideas are taken. When I come up with a great idea, apart from Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers podcast, they, uh, man, somebody's are beating me to it. Well, you're doubting yourself. Uh, I say you write the book anyway. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. So we've got some, uh, some qualities, some skills that maybe make you just a good human generally, but that I think are especially important for, you know, for the psychedelic therapist. We have another episode where we talked about trip sitting, we called it, mm-hmm. you know, some of the differences between trip, we think, between trip sitting and, and actual therapeutic facilitation. Yeah. That was a July 27th episode we did with Derek Moody called The Art and Science of Psychedelic Trip Sitting. So check it out, folks, yeah. if you want to hear more. That was a fun chat. Yeah. Yeah, Derek's great. I mean, that's why Smart we do dude. this, fun chats. <laughs> True. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about that the other day, like, what do I really like about being a podcast host or about having a podcast. The fame and fortune. I Obviously knew it. that, yeah. right? I have people just coming up to me on the streets. Hey, I recognize your beard. Um, no, it's the, uh, it's the fact that I get to have a very focused, uninterrupted conversation with somebody I respect and admire. And it's, it's, it's like a level of intimacy. Some of it's, I think, some of the reasons why I enjoy psychotherapy so much. It's, yeah. it's a level of interpersonal intimacy that off, it's hard to get out in the real world when you're busy and distracted. Yeah, distractions are uh, a big factor in that, yeah. aren't they? It's one another reason why I love to listen to long form conversation style podcasts because it's I get to um, listen into a conversation like that where people are being vulnerable, people are it's messy, they're making mistakes, but yeah. it's real and authentic and honest, you hope. I mean, people can still lie when they're on a podcast, but not over a three-hour episode. You Good can't. luck. Good luck no. remaining consistent. I, I have a question, though. Where does it go from here? <laughs> because the long form, I agree, it's fun to listen to, but uh, I struggle to find the time to get through 
three hour Joe Rogan episodes sure. <laughs> multiple times a week, as I'm sure many others do. Um, yeah. Where does long form end in this evolution? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it ends. I think people, podcasts are popular enough. I think yeah. people are getting, especially when you compare what you can get out of a long form conversation to what you could get from sound bites, let's say on like a cable news channel. Oh, or yeah. even from something like a really well-produced NPR style uh, podcast or radio show, um, you know, they, they do a good job of telling a story. It's, you know, cool music and all that stuff, highly produced, but it's still short and sound bitey. Yeah, and sound bitey can be a big trap. Like yeah. the fact that they have to grab attention in such a short amount of time mm-hmm. makes for some you know, clickbait or exaggerated headlines that uh, can be really counterproductive, especially for us trying to preach the good word of good sound, yeah. wise knowledge, yeah, <laughs> evidence-based lose, wisdom. You lose detail, you lose nuance sometimes. Yeah. Time and a place for those things. Like I, I really enjoy short form content as well. Um, informative short form content, but yeah, it, it gives you, it makes it easier to jump to a conclusion and land and, and not jump from it. Yeah. There's this quote from a book I like. It's actually from an eating disorder book, mm-hmm. but um, called God, Women, Food. Oh, yeah. But I heard you mention that it, one. It's, it was something like, enlightenment is following one thing through all the way to the end. Mm. And, you know, context not even really mattering for this this example. I like it. I mean, yeah. it just shows the beauty of depth. Beauty of depth. I think focus and depth is something we are, at least I'll speak for myself, I'm losing a tight grip on. Yeah. With all the distractions. Maybe we could put those on our list uh, of qualities of guides that we can call how to be a good human yeah. focus and depth. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, you know, it's a great segue back to our topic, Reed. I think focus, uh, being present and attentive yeah. are really, really important qualities of the, the therapeutic facilitator. You know, one thing I've really appreciated in the way you do CAP and teach others to do it is that quality of holding space mm. and giving your whole presence to the person, even if they are off on a magical journey with eye shades and headphones on. I remember right. the other week when you had a group in this room and down the hall in the ketamine room, uh, learning CAP, doing CAP, mentoring others in CAP. And uh, yeah, you mentioned that that was one thing that you were trying to teach and model, and I really like it. Yeah, yeah I think it's really, really important. And I think, you know, I, it's something that uh, is in, I've tried to cultivate as, as, as a psychotherapist generally, presence mm-hmm. and focus, because I think a lot of what brings a person to psychotherapy is the fact that they haven't been seen or validated in their day-to-day life. Um, as it brings them to be a therapist? Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> in some ways, like I, I'm becoming the person I wish I had had in my life yeah. as a therapist. But, you know, pot- clients come in because they don't, they don't get that. They don't, I mean, it's hard to find that unconditional attention yeah. uh, in day-to-day life and regular relationships, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so to provide that for somebody, to really feel, to feel seen by someone, even if it's somebody you're paying to see you, it's still authentic and genuine if it's done right by the therapist. Yeah. Um, and when you're on psychedelics, it leaves you, your, your ego's dissolving, your emotions are cracked wide open, depending on the medicine. It's all the more important to have somebody who's holding that kind of space with rapt attention and care. Yeah. And it took me a while to learn that as a young clinician, therapist, even teacher of meditation and yoga. I always, I had this pressure that was deeply ingrained to say something wise or teach a lot of cool stuff, mm. you know, and it was probably ego fueled and uh, maybe fear mm-hmm. driven in some ways. But then when I finally started to learn that idea of getting out of the way of the magic of whether it's the medicine or the process, the, the uh, inner healer that mm. were there supporting in folks. Uh, it was amazing and also helped me relax and not worry so much about going into uh, beforehand going into therapy sessions or classes or teaching situations. Yeah. 
I have that kind of that similar feeling. Like I notice that if I am starting to talk a lot in a therapy session or do lots of didactic instruction, psychoeducation, um, not that those things aren't helpful. They can be tremendously helpful, but, uh, I notice I tend to do it when I'm feeling a little insecure for some reason. Yeah. Huh. You know, that's my, my trigger. And, and one of the things, uh, these are the qualities or, uh, skills that we think these therapists should have is to have a good working knowledge of transference and countertransference of your own triggers as a psychotherapist. Mm-hmm, for um, sure. And that's definitely one for me. Like if I notice I'm talking a lot to the client, it's okay. Why aren't you listening? There's that acronym that we teach our clients that we've learned as, uh, to ask them or not our clients, our, our, um, clinicians, wait, why am I talking? Yeah, they use that in the MAPS uh, MDMA therapy yeah. training. Um, uh, a very useful reminder to get out of the way of the medicine. And and I like to remind myself of that uh, in other settings too. Like I brought up yoga and meditation. That's a, a good example where I've had to learn and relearn of get out of the way of the yoga. <laughs> Let people have their experience. Silence is actually a beautiful thing in these kinds of environments um, or time for things to really sink in and people to do their own process. Yeah. Man, I, I had some good instruction on that early in graduate school about using silence therapeutically mm-hmm. instead of questions. I had a supervisor once say, never ask a question. Uh-huh. I thought it's never a was a little strong. Yeah. <laughs> a little strong. I found some questions well, very, very try useful. Try it. I mean, it's good exercise. <laughs> but I did have some sessions where I did. I just tried, instead of questions, I would do reflections. Mm-hmm. So the client says, you know, uh, mm. I, yeah, <laughs> hmm. and then then nod or, you know, they, they say something and just reflect it back in a way that provokes um, thought in them. What the? Just kidding. No. And then I did have, you know, I, I sometimes when I wanted to ask a question, but I chose to just reflect or just be silent, I would get something out of the client that I didn't expect that was yeah. really valuable, but I would have missed had I redirected them with a question that I thought was keeping them on the path. Yeah. Um, but I totally would have missed something. Now, I've also had silence backfire. Uh, I, I remember one time I had a client share something really vulnerable with me and I was choosing to be silent and she that was she was really hurt by that. She said, mm. I just shared this really vulnerable thing with you that I've never told anybody about and you just sat there. You didn't say anything. So we mm. had to do a lot of work to repair that. But Yeah, that's that's interesting. And and in the end, like do you do you really know if it, if you misstepped as a clinician? Is there even an answer to this, or mm. that you just brought up another useful trigger to follow in yeah. the healing process? Yeah. Uh, Could have been some useful transference for therapy, her to explore. Yeah, therapy's uh, a nuanced art, isn't it? An art and a science, I think. Mm-hmm. I remember one time in grad school, uh, one of our supervisors who was a, a CBT ardent. She loved cognitive behavioral therapy, and and. Uh, she was presenting on it in a case conference or something. And one of our, one of the students made a comment that was sort of critical. Like, you know, anybody could do this. You're just following a manual. And she said, well, it's difficult to do artfully. And she used that word very specifically, difficult to do Mm -hmm. artfully. And I think it is, it's a, it's a science and an art. And, but it makes me wonder, like we call it an art. There are some artists who uh, have some kind of natural inclination Mm-hmm. to either visual art or musical art or whatever the kind of art we're talking about and and some that don't right i'm sure you could train me to be a a decent comic book sketch artist but i don't have i don't have what appears to be any natural talent for drawing when i try it it looks pretty rough yeah i'm i'm certainly of the opinion that you can learn and train a hell of a lot more than you think mm-hmm. <laughs> like it it does trigger something in me when people say oh i cannot cook period. I'm like, prove it, (laughs) you know, following a, there's following a recipe and then there's the getting creative artfully, um, making a beautiful mess on top of that or, or mashing things up. And, and I'm of, of the belief that when in doubt, you know, you follow the recipe and then you start to add your flair Mm. as you, as you go. And, you know, I think the same applies to psychiatry in a way there's a lot of science of course you know, i hope behind yeah, yeah. what we do in our evidence based prescribing you know we have to but but the fuzzy stuff the human 
uh, connection stuff, the attunement, those more subtle things. I think that's where the what we call the art, um, mm-hmm. but it's also learned over time, and we all start at different places in that process of you know, natural temperament and the amount of work we've done and the amount of, of uh, skills and practice we've done in other related ways. Right. So there might be some natural temperaments that, um, that lend themselves to, to becoming an effective psychotherapist compared to others. Yeah. Right? That, that might be the case. But maybe some <laughs> people who have a temperament that is irritable or anxious... Uh, and not so open, they might have a harder time being an effective therapist. What I hear you say, yeah. Reed, is that, that that doesn't mean that it would be impossible. Like you can learn skills and you can develop awareness uh, and um, develop in those important areas to be maybe a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. Suited like, for therapy. like I was just uh, thinking about this earlier when I heard a statistic uh, around nar- narcissism, for mm-hmm. example, like. Four percent of the uh, U.S. adult male population is thought to have some kind of, I don't know, clinical level of significant mar- narcissistic traits, it and like uh, it does, and uh, not a you know a formal diagnostic criterion. And I don't know how accurate it is. I heard it in a podcast actually yeah. from a researcher, um, but it got me thinking of you know. We believe as clinicians that you can, there's healing out there, there's growth. Uh, and we see it all the time that people do get through and overcome significant psychopathology, like uh, personality disorders included. And uh, narcissism, even the word, comes from this, this idea of being deeply wounded. And you know, you can do healing and growth work around that and get to the other side of that and have uh, much more kind of empathetic, compassionate presence, but that's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. 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 It is a lot of work. Some people are further away from that goalpost than others, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it does, I think, highlight as a foundational point, the value and the imperative, in fact, of doing your own work. Mm. If you want to work, um, efficiently and compassionately in this space. Yeah. And that's something that I think is common. You know, there are a lot of experts that speak on these this topic that we're talking about today, like what kind of qualities and skills yeah. a psychedelic therapist should have. And that's one that's pretty common to most of the manuals and papers and talks that you'll find out there. Um, yeah, yeah. In fact, it's there was that pivotal paper. I mean, I consider it pivotal <laughs> because there aren't that many papers on this. There's some pivotal books and things through the years that we could touch on. I mean, I think we... We jotted some notes down yeah. from them, but one paper by Janice Phelps in 2017 uh, outlined these six competencies. What did it say? Um, six competencies of uh, guides or facilitators. She's over the CIIS, yeah. California Institute of Integral Studies. And number one is, and I love the term, empathetic abiding presence. Yeah. Yeah. Not just presence, not just abiding presence, right. which is kind of cool, but yeah. empathetic abiding presence. Yeah. You got to be able to feel what the other person feels and stay there and stay there, which yeah. is, it's, that's a tall order yeah. for a lot of people. You know, empathy, uh, isn't always easy to have. In fact, it's often not easy to have. Yeah. Uh, and you know, we could even do a whole episode on empathy, talking yeah. about the difference empathy and compassion and things like that. But Perhaps yeah. we should. <laughs> to be able to have it, as you, as you said, like abide, especially over the course of a six-hour, six to eight-hour psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy session or even longer for MDMA or haven't yeah. forbid we ever do LSD-assisted psychotherapy, right? Are we, it's coming. It's, it's coming even next year. Possibly, in right? In studies, yeah. 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 That's a long time for empathy to abide. Yeah. But so important. Hence, uh, that one that we just added to these lists, uh, focus. <laughs> mm. um, but uh, the next one on Janice Phelps' list, I find interesting, trust enhancement. Uh, yeah. yeah. How trust. do you conceptualize, how do you make sense of that one? I think about it like trusting, first of all, what's foundational to a good therapeutic relationship generally is trust, right? And yeah. any relationship. <laughs> and it, yeah, yeah. touche, right? Any yeah. relationship. 
trust. So your client being able to trust you as mm-hmm. a therapist that you will be able to that hold the space for them in a caring and empathic way. Um, and you're going to keep what they share with you private. That's kind of there's the, the anatomy of trust in a therapeutic relationship is there. The anatomy of trust. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Another book title for you for band name. <laughs> um, I'll write it down. <laughs> and yeah. then trust in the inner healer, like you talked about earlier. Um, we want to be able to trust the medicine, get out of the way of the inner healer, create this, facilitate this environment, this therapeutic environment where this inner healing intelligence or your higher self or whatever you want to call it can do its work, can be revealed and, um, and do its work. And then trust in the process generally, I think, Mm -hmm. as part of that trust enhancement. Yeah. I don't think we can highlight enough the need to as efficiently as possible build a foundation of trust Mm -hmm. for the therapeutic process Um, it's the reason behind one of the reasons behind the preparation session but just thinking about it uh, looking back on my own career so far how that has developed and how useful it's been to be able to have more and more of that is to be able to go into a session with an individual or with a family or a couple and uh, within the first few minutes find some kind of trust mm-hmm. yeah yeah it's something i've i have to remind myself of because i start to take it for granted as a therapist people come in and they just there's some unspoken trust you can rupture it really quick but yeah um and then sometimes i forget in my day-to-day life that people don't just Look at me and trust me. <laughs> like you don't trust me? <laughs> Come on. I'm Not super nice. everyone loves and finds extremely naturally trusting your uh, beautiful beard. I know. No. <laughs> Believe it or not. I did have some people who were really shocked by it in New York. I can't remember if we talked about that on the last podcast, but oh, oh my gosh. It, we haven't talked about it enough. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I was telling my mom this story the other day. Just the, uh, the guy at the pizza shop, he's you know busy getting my calzone and... Uh, he hasn't made eye contact yet. And he's like, okay, is this uh, what you want? He looks up at me and goes, holy shit, your beard is amazing. How long does it take you to grow a beard like that? I'm butchering the accent, of course, but <laughs> it was, uh, I was, I was flattered. I hope you didn't, uh, say that word to your mother. Well, I did you know, <laughs> because I'm taking a stance here that mom sometimes I swear. And she's, she's okay with it. She's just not going to recommend the podcast to her friends, which I Humbly but accept. she'll she'll still listen. She will. Yeah. Thankfully. Yeah. She hasn't. She didn't kick me out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, do you live with your mom. No. I'm just no. Thankfully, no. no nothing I, wrong I, with I li- that. I live with yeah. my with my wife, <laughs> which is yeah. thankfully very very different. Yeah. Sorry if there was judgment spilling it's out okay, of that. Okay, man. You know what? I'm teasing. I, I have lived with my mother in my adult yeah. life. Yeah. And it was. I, I have blissful, as well. Beautiful. Yeah. It's. Uh, I mean, my my parents' uh, kind of basement. Mm-hmm. Like walkout basement has been the uh, landing place for most of their children in between homes or, or things like that. And it's been a nice uh, little refuge. So <laughs> grateful for it. Yeah. So yeah. Grateful. And yeah, I hope, uh, I mean, my basement is becoming that tonight. I'll go pick up my oldest son from the airport. Mm. Um, who's back from the farm in Hawaii. Awesome. You know, you know, Dallin. Yeah, I love Dallin. shout out to Dallin. Shout out to He's Dallin. uh He's uh, one of the listeners of this with our moms. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm glad Dallin can hear me compliment him. <laughs> he's a wonderful person. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Golden-hearted guy. Yep, he could be a, a stellar guide. I think he could. <laughs> I think he could. Um, um, so what else is on Janice's, Janice's list? list here? Spiritual intelligence, Ooh. which I had, to, I had to really read in her um, article about this because I didn't know what she was talking about. I mean, I got had a sense for what she was talking mm-hmm. about. We've had other episodes where we talked about spirituality yeah, and work in spiritual realms with psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. But, um, you know, she talks about having an appreciation for the unknowable, for the transpersonal, for the way human beings attempt to make meaning in life, Mm -hmm. you know, um, and to hold sacred space, sacred meaning, respectful, right, space for uh, the different kinds of spiritual pretense people bring to their experiences. Yeah. And trying not to color 
how you're, you're helping or facilitating or guiding or their experience with maybe your own religious biases or spiritual biases, but holding this sort of respectful open container. Yeah. I mean, I, I like the term. I do think it, there's a risk of some people getting tripped up on it. Yeah. Um, that spiritual intelligence, but, but yeah, I mean, we sh- we should also do a whole deep dive on transpersonal yeah. psychotherapy sometime because I think that is a prerequisite to understand what is beyond the ego, beyond mm-hmm. the scene, beyond the material world, and because that comes up so much in this process. Yeah, I think when you work with psychedelic medicines, you, it would be really hard to avoid the topic of spirituality. You know, it just, it comes up so much, this sense of oneness with the earth and with others and with the cosmos or with God. Um, it's hard to have a very, to hold a very sterile container, one that has been sterilized of all things spiritual, mm-hmm. which we've talked about before in the podcast is kind of, you know, psychiatry and psychology went, has gone through this phase of, sort of <laughs> spiritual sterilization. It's gone through the autoclave machine yeah. if you encountered those before it's a like surgical tool sterilization device oh, okay yeah you're gonna, <laughs> you're talking to a psychologist i had no idea what that meant but autoclave yeah um in the non-disposable surgical instruments oh, okay um that's how they sterilize like metal them. stuff they'll put it in this uh giant metal box that just steams it at uh, such such a high temperature that no Kills bug everything. could ever survive yeah I would remember being shocked once to see that the surgical implements that my surgeon had um, were like DeWalt. They, they were. <laughs> <laughs> they looked very similar to what you would buy at Home Depot, uh, just shinier, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Hopefully cleaner. One of my earliest jobs, and this is just a kind of un- semi-related tension, <laughs> but it was working in a kitchen, and I started out before cooking, washing dishes. This is summers in high school. And, mm-hmm. and the dishwasher, looking back on it, looks strangely similar to an autoclave. We had this <laughs> massive dishwash machine that I put things in and close this box and steam would be spilling out. And I'd be like, yeah, be trying not to get scalded. Yeah. Who knew your dishwashing skills would translate to your surgeon skills? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you never know, folks. Um, Number four on her list, knowledge of the physical and psychological effects of psychedelics. That seems pretty straightforward. Yeah, I like that one better than how Stan Groff puts it. No offense, Stan. Mm -hmm. Um, When he talks about prerequisite with the medicine you're, well, experience with the medicine you're working with as an absolute imperative or prerequisite, you know, while I don't disagree that it's extremely helpful, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've seen here that you don't have to have had a ketamine experience yourself to be able to help someone if you learn enough about it and, and have the right kind of mentorship and other transpersonal or non-ordinary states, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, it's, It's, and we, you know, we want to express that we appreciate that this is this is a controversial subject. Yeah, it's a subject. debate, bring it's a, it on. Yeah, debated topic, but I agree with you, Reed. I think to, to draw that really bright line and say that if, if you are going to facilitate a psychedelic experience for somebody, as a guide, trip sitter, therapist, what have you, you have to have firsthand experience with that particular medicine. It seems a little dogmatic to me. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'll just sort of piggyback on what you said. I think if you have some good training and have a good working cognitive knowledge of what types of experiences people have um, and enough supervised experience with people going through those experiences, then I think you could do a really good job yeah. as a therapist or a facilitator. And, you know, as we talk about this, uh, you know, I'm realizing again and again that it is really a debate and there are, you know, two sides to this coin and we could you know, flip-flop and debate it either way. But it reminds me of a quote that we've mentioned on here before that I heard at a MAPS conference a a couple years ago um, when Marcella Odolora, MAPS trainer, said to Tim Ferriss in this live podcast interview, you can only take someone as deep as you've gone yourself. And, you know, there, there may be something to it, what Stan is saying about, you know, if you've never had an LSD experience and you're working with someone in, uh, or many people, especially in a 
deep way uh, with that medicine, um, it is harder to get the all the nuances and the possibilities and the varieties of the experience down from seminars and right. books and but uh, yeah but. nuances and varieties of the experiences yes but I uh, just for the fun of having the argument like I, I think <laughs> depth is achievable without psychedelics yeah right psychedelics certainly can take a person deep but they're not a necessary condition for psychological yeah. depth that's it. It could be a trap even, like, oh, I know LSD. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take you in this door. Yeah. But there is so much infinite variety of this stuff that it also brings up that that uh, thing we started with of get out of the way of the medicine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and why am I talking is a good mantra to remember. Yeah. I like what you brought up. Like the, the trap of I know LSD could also be... Um, well, I know LSD, I've had that experience that I think you're talking about, and this is the meaning I made out of it. And so then you sort of project on your client, well, this is the meaning that you need to make out of this, even if it's subconscious. Uh, and then all of a sudden you've gone from, you know, getting out of the way of the medicine to being in the way of the medicine because you're putting you, your interpretation onto their experience. You just guided them down the wrong rabbit hole, perhaps. Right. Right. So yeah, I don't think depth, in order to take somebody deep, that you necessarily have to have a psychedelic experience. Yeah. Um, but you have to have, uh, you have to have some depth mm-hmm. <laughs> and ability to take people deep and, and to hold that, uh, hold space for that process. Yeah, and I think, does she talk about it? So therapist self-awareness and ethical integrity are is the fifth on her list. So part of self-awareness, I think, we you know, use the phrase doing your own work. It's really mm-hmm. important as a professional helper to get real familiar with your own triggers, your own sensitivities, your own yeah. you know, uh, insecurities. Mm-hmm. That's another good one that, well, it's pretty broadly encompassing that fifth point on her list, therapist self-awareness mm-hmm. and ethical integrity. Right. <laughs> um, they could both be huge um, volumes on their own. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think, and one of the things that self-awareness helps you with as a therapist is to be, uh, um, to, to be, I'm forgetting the word, equanimity? Yeah. What's, what's the adjective? Equanimous? Mm-hmm. To be, <laughs> to be yeah. equanimous? Um, and because the more aware you are of your triggers, the more sort of calm in the midst of that storm you can be, the storm of a, another person's emotions. So if I know that I'm really just sort of by disposition or training uh, uncomfortable with displays of sadness or whatever, I'm just <laughs> making this up. Yeah. Um, but if I know that about me and my client starts to weep and I know I tend to want to like fix and get them to stop crying because I'm uncomfortable yeah. with their sadness because of X, Y, and Z. And that pops up in me, I can notice it do what I need to do to get past it and then refocus on them. And you may have learned that from like a lot of psilocybin experiences, but you probably learned it instead from like years of being in a relationship and learning that jumping in and fixing is sometimes counterproductive or, or, uh, long-term meditation practice where you worked on that equanimity to this point of some kind of flexibility or even unflappability mm-hmm. to uh, reacting to triggers. Right, <laughs> yeah. right. Things like that. It doesn't, so, come to, it doesn't have to come from your own psychedelic experiences. Yeah, there's this idea that, uh, you know, psychedelics are the crash course mm. and um, complementary practices like meditation, for example, are the tried and tested path. Right. Yeah. And I bring that up in part because it ties into her sixth point, which is proficiency in complementary techniques. Mm-hmm. And she doesn't say which ones, which I quite like, um, because there are many, but, you know, some kind of, you know, breathing, breath work, uh, Kind of meditation skills, I think, are a huge prerequisite for people going through their first psychedelic experience, but also for the clinician guide to be able to 
teach that in the process or bring those into the equation when needed on the fly even. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we have some assumptions about which techniques might be complementary. assumptions based on the work that was done in the 60s, 70s. Um, and the, the, the few trials that were done before the, you know, the quote unquote psychedelic renaissance. That's one of the cool things that I think is going to get borne out by all the new clinical trial research that's going on that we're a part yeah. of, which techniques will be most complementary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're also key to integration mm -hmm. as well. What are the practices that support one's integration? Right. Um, or else these are just psychedelic trips. Yeah, yeah. They're just, you know, novel, weird experiences. So that's her six. Um, there are others uh, that are related, and there's we'll try to avoid some redundancy here, but... Um, there's a quote by James Fadiman in his Psychedelic Explorer's Guide that I wrote down that I wanted to read that I thought was apropos to the topic. So, the more centered you are as a guide, the more effective you will be. The more you know about yourself and whomever you are guiding, the more likely you are able to stay centered and tranquil throughout the session. So like we were talking about a second ago. When you yourself are more comfortable, it will be easier for the voyager to transition from one state of awareness to another. After reviewing hundreds of sessions in different settings, Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert, or Ram Dass, concluded, in most situations that a voyager became distressed when the guide had become unsettled, uncertain, or upset. Mm. So uh, underscores what we were talking about before. So oh, I yeah. lied about redundancy a second ago. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think super important to be as centered as you can. Yeah. experience for that person. I've seen that's another example of uh, key skills in this work in general and in being a good, compassionate, useful human to those around you. Um, and I've seen it play out time and time again in situations ranging from ketamine assisted psychotherapy to ayahuasca retreat settings to um, agitation in the ER or psychiatric unit <laughs> right. where like if I go in with a ramped up or frazzled energy, l that's, that's just going to fuel the fire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if there's a situation in need of like de-escalating, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I know that you have to, you know, pause like muster up all the calm and composure and peace and equanimity you can and then enter and uh, kind of share that with the situation rather than kind of a frazzled, chaotic uh, approach. Yeah. yeah, and like you were talking about earlier, the, the qualities of the psychedelic therapist are also the qualities of the just good person to be in a relationship with. I noticed the same thing with my family. Like if yeah. I come home from work and I'm in a bad mood, and yeah. I come into the home, I, it, the way, the, what the energy that I bring into the home really will have an effect on everyone else's mm -hmm. and vice versa. Like if, if I come into the home and everyone's sort of, you know, annoyed with each other or they're tired or they're irritable and I come in with a fun, you know, happy, positive energy, I can change that for them. Energy is contagious and psychedelics are energy amplifiers, energy detectors in a way where uh, the individual on a substance, they can not only see it, detect it, sense it, feel it, but probably even more than they can in day-to-day -day life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you see that as a psychedelic therapist, like if somebody's having a, a very challenging experience that doesn't seem to be particularly therapeutic, typically we, you know, challenging doesn't mean bad. Yeah. Um, but you can change it or help them navigate it by simply changing the music, for example, that has an energetic signature yeah. to it. Yeah. Or uh, saying something or being with them in a way that, that switches the energy. And you'll sometimes it turns on a dime. You'll see people's experience change. Yeah. Uh, I love the technique of also um, setting a rhythm of breath, like somewhat close to the individual, but more steady and bringing it you know, gradually down. It's kind of like mirroring in general. Like you, you can, you might need a certain energy to enter their space sufficiently and then like then working um, gently to diffuse, uh, you know, a, a situation heading towards panic, for example, but with patience, like you can't rush those things either. Right. Yeah, if we haven't said it already, patience is a really important quality. 
Yeah, did that end up on one of these lists? <laughs> I'm sure we've mentioned it. Patience. Um, Fadiman also talks about compassion and intuition. Intuition is one of those things that I feel like is hard to train. <laughs> how do you? Yeah. How do you teach someone to be intuitive? Well, it comes yeah. with experience a lot. I think. I mean, wisdom and intuition come a lot with repetition. Yeah, we should. We should do. Um, I should write these down, but we should do a, a deep dive on that because yeah. it's a fascinating topic. Um, and how does it tie into what we were talking about earlier of the uh, wisdom of emotions that give us signals from within ourselves of how to navigate life in a good way yeah. and and how does that relate? Um, but, uh, but yeah, I like Fadiman's. Those were actually from something that he was involved in called the Guild of Guides, <laughs> and they had <laughs> this... Yeah, it is a cool name, huh? It's like their D&D group or something. Compassion, intuition, and loving kindness. Mm -hmm. um, or like Carl Rogers might say, unconditional positive regard. Right. Um, but Fadiman didn't care. He came in the transpersonal era where, you know, you could start saying things like love again. Yeah, yeah 60s. Love yeah. Love, that's there you go. There was a time to do it. Yeah. So that's from uh, the Psychedelic Explorer's Guide, those yeah. Fadiman ones and that quote you read. One, one other that I really like is uh, another old book from that era or even a little earlier um, by Tim Leary, Ralph Metzner, and Dick Alpert, a.k.a. Ram Dass, mm -hmm. uh, who wrote uh, Psychedelic Experience, a manual based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Mm -hmm. I uh, found that on Audible a few years ago and was just enamored. Yeah? Like, yeah. I'd, uh, I'd, I'd never heard of that one. Yeah. Um, it's a fun one, but I'll just uh, read their points for a second mm -hmm. because I think they're, they're pretty complementary to these other ones. So these are key factors of guiding. One, ability to turn off your own ego and social games, particularly to muffle your own power needs and fears. Kind of like what we were talking about, but said bluntly. Yeah, I love it. Uh, considerable experience in psychedelic sessions, him or herself, and in guiding others. Yeah, so psych the psychedelic experience, let's say, any non-ordinary state. Right. Um, and then they even go on to say that it's, um, well, they have a strong opinion of the need <laughs> to, for your own experience. So we won't open up that can of worms debate other than just acknowledging once again that it's a debate and we see the right. we see both sides um right. and then the last thing that uh i pulled out from their list is the guide should be relaxed solid accepting and secure relaxed solid accepting and secure yeah that's kind of how i want to be th th <laughs> in everyday life 2022 like, resolution there you go <laughs> that's my my goal we keep coming back to that. It just, you know, these qualities that would make for a good psychotherapist, a good clinician, a good psychedelic assisted guide. Make for good human intentions. Yeah. Did you want to be <laughs> friends with a person who had those qualities? Steve is relaxed, solid, accepting, and secure. Of everyone he but liked myself. Steve. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so uh, a quote from that book. The guide must remain passively sensitive and intuitively relaxed for several hours, like you were saying, mm -hmm. maintaining a state of alert quietism in which he or she is poised with ready flexibility. The guide must never be bored, I guess, or look bored, <laughs> um, yeah, talkative, bored. intellectualizing. Ooh. He or she must remain calm during the long periods of swirling, mindlessness mm. interesting yeah. yeah must never be bored i mean of course you're allowed i think to experience the emotion of boredom um yeah but it's what you do with it right like you said you don't want to give the impression of boredom or maybe it, boredom is a signal from your nervous system that you need to reorient to the client um maybe you're lost in your own thoughts yeah yeah and then they go on to say when you're fully present i like this you consciously and compassionately share the present moment with another, and you believe in and affirm this person's potential for wholeness wherever they are in those moments. Mm. Like uh, you 
see their inner healer. You see their potential. You see them as a whole, complete human, not needing anything, just needing a little bit of compassion abiding presence uh, to let them help them return to wholeness. Yeah. I like that too. Seeing their potential for wholeness would maybe help you do some of the other things they're talking about in there, being still yeah. in the presence of either their mindlessness or their, uh, you know, the storm, emotional storm that tends yeah, to Yeah, seeing, oh, this is just a storm happening that is clearing the path towards yeah. wholeness. Let's just make it a safe uh, place for that storm to pass. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's lots of good resources out there. Um, people who have said more than we have today uh, about what makes for a good psychedelic assisted psychotherapist. I think we've covered some good ones. Before we wrap up, Reed, any other essential qualities that you think such a person should have? Uh, no, I, I, th I think we've really, we've really covered it with that, uh, everything from that empathetic abiding presence to, uh, compassion, intuition, and loving kindness. So yeah. yeah, that's been fun. Awesome. Thanks, Reed. Thanks everybody for listening. We'll catch you next week. Thank you, dear listener, for listening. It means a lot to me. Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers is brought to you by Novamind, a mental health company that specializes in psychedelic medicine and research. You can learn more about Novamind's mission to increase access to legal, safe, and evidence-based psychedelic medicine at novamind.ca. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're using to listen or watch. Also, if you're feeling generous today, please leave us a glowing review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen. If you'd like to reach out to us with questions, suggestions, scathing criticisms, etc., please email us at psychfrontiers at novamind.ca. Thanks again. The content of this podcast does not constitute medical advice or mental health treatment. Please consult a medical or mental health professional if you believe you are in need of mental health treatment.